Okay, so yeah, my name is Hillary Parker. Um, and see, I have Etsy there, big, big orange letters. Um, so yeah, as Karthik just said, I'm a data scientist at Stitch Fix currently. Um, I've been there about a year. Um, before that, I was at Etsy, and I'm pointing that out in part because a lot of um, the theme of this talk, I actually am borrowing a lot of the kind of cultural things I learned from the culture at Etsy um, in terms of what I'll be talking about. I also have a podcast called Not So Standard Deviations. Recommend checking it out. Um, cool. So yeah, like uh, like any good talk, I'm going to start with a tweet of mine from two years ago. Um, and so I know that the title of this talk is a little confusing: opinionated analysis development. What does that mean? Um, and really, the idea for this talk started um, about two years, a year and a half ago, November of 2015. Um, at that point, I'd just been through kind of all the summer conferences with R and um, like statistical conferences, and I felt like there was a real gap in the way that we talk about people writing code. Um, I don't know how many people here know the Use R conference. Anyone? Yeah. Um, so Use R, for example, is this code. I mean, the title makes it sound like it's for using R, <laughs> but it's really more about like developing R packages, I would say. Um, and so, as you can see from this tweet, I was like, we really are missing a word for people who want to write code like reproducible code, careful code, efficient code for doing analysis, but not necessarily developing packages that they want to open source and share with a bunch of people. Um, and so then I said, like, what about analysis developer? Um, any other ideas? And so obviously with the title of this talk, I decided to stick with this. Um, but I did want to go through what some other people were saying and shoot them down here when they're not available. So easiest argument ever. <laughs> so um, the first one, like, I get this a lot. Like, how is this different than a data scientist? Um, and so in order to answer this, I just got one of, like, the first Google results for what is a data scientist. And it's, like, this woman who knows all of math and statistics and all domain knowledge and soft skills, so, like, business schools obviously knows how to program like database like is essentially the db admin for her company and then also knows how to communicate and visualize the data so like all of these are things that you need to know i could have substituted in drew conway's you know venn diagram hopefully with the unicorn on top of it i want to borrow that yeah. in the future um but obviously like data scientist is like such a useless term in my opinion it doesn't actually get to any like you can say your job tells data scientist and you basically have no information about what that person actually does on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not a good way to define like this very specific subset of what I was talking about. Um, someone else chimed in and said, what about a reproducible researcher? Um, and I like this, and I think reproducibility is something I've cared about for a long time. It's a good word, generally. Um, but I think there's more than just reproducibility with what I'm talking about. Um, specifically, there's you know, you want to create analyses or the code for analyses that's reproducible, but there's also a sense of accuracy, like you want to know that your code is accurate in doing what you think it's doing. Um, there's also a collaborative aspect that we never talk about. So if you're writing analysis code that you want other people to access and possibly contribute to, like reproducibility, that idea kind of falls apart and doesn't discuss collaborative tooling at all. Um, so I thought it was a little bit too limited to just call this reproducible coding. Um, Hadley Wickham then chimed in and was like, oh, what about a data analysis engineer? Um, and this is, a, this is a divide that we have not been able to solve yet. So I think of it as like, I'm Regina George trying, or I'm, I'm Gretchen trying to make fetch happen. <laughs> and Hadley's Regina George, like, you're not going to make fetch happen. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, but really when you come down to it, there's, it's sort of a tomato, tomato, like you have software developers, um, you have software engineers. I think we like think of those as the same person or the same type of person, same job title. And so it's the same thing, like a software developer develops software. And so I wanted something like an analysis developer develops analysis. Um, I personally like developer a little better than engineer. Um, I like the fact that development kind of brings this, uh, like it's a word, you think of it in terms of, so this is a picture of my cat that I had to like sneak in. Uh, and this is her as a kitten, and this is her much older, and I like the development, like she's developing into this, you know, majestic creature. Um, similarly, you know, you develop an analysis, you get it into a more final state. Um, 
And yeah, I, like, I also developed as a photographer. I'm not quite at Max's level yet, but I'm trying to get there. Um, so when we talk about developing an analysis, there really are two specific components that I think it's really important to tease apart. Um, the first is developing the narrative of the analysis. And so that's like the, almost like the scientific argument. Like what point are you trying to make? What models are you going to use to make that point? Um, what arguments are you going to make? Like what type of visualizations are you going to make to display those arguments? Um, and just generally, how are you going to convince your audience that the thing that you're doing is the, like the conclusion you made is the right conclusion. Um, and so it's kind of like I'm, I'm, I want to sidestep all of this and say, OK, that's obviously really important. That's why we train statisticians, why we train data scientists. You could talk about this pretty much forever. And this is a constantly evolving thing that needs to adapt to the audience. But then when we talk about like, what I call the technical artifact, um, it gets a lot more specific, where it's like, what tools are you going to use to make the deliverable that's going to tell your narrative? Um, what technical co coding choices are you going to make? Like, are you going to be using like the tidyverse or R or Python? Like, there's just a bunch of choices you make, um, and talking about that is frequently as important as talking about the narrative aspect. Um, so, so that's sort of the why I think this term needs to be there. Um, so then I got this tweet from Carl Broman, who's like the sweetest person ever. Um, and I perpetually feel guilty that I'm throwing him under the bus in this talk. Um, but he was saying, oh, like, what about a good analyst? Um, and I didn't get this just from him. A lot of people are like, well, all these things you describe of writing accurate, reproducible code, that's just like part of the job description of a data analyst. Um, and so as I said, Explicit disclaimer that Carl's like a really nice guy. He'll email you with pages of help if you ask him for it. He's non-judgmental. Um, but that being said, I took issue with this idea of a good analyst um, because obviously the opposite of that is like a bad analyst, right? Um, someone who's doing their job poorly. Um, and that just didn't like sit well with me. I, I think like like. Convincing people to do something based on like shaming them is almost never a good idea. Um, but I will say one thing, uh, my thoughts on this have evolved a little bit since this original tweet, um, which is that I was talking specifically about the job title and the person here of like analysis developer. But I actually think it's more important to talk about um, analysis development or this process of making this technical artifact. Um, and so, like I said before, calling people a bad analyst, I think, is just like not a helpful, um, not a helpful way of communicating that they're not doing this effectively. Um, and why is that? Because creating analysis is very hard. Um, it's very error-ridden. We all know that. And uh, as like channeling my Elaine Seinfeld, we kind of yada yada it away. Um, we talk about the we talk about the narrative, and we talk about the point we're making, and we kind of hide away all of the work we're doing on the code to get there. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that happens. Um, I know from statistician's point of view, I have a statistical background, there's this idea that it's limiting creativity, um, like you just need to do what you need to do to get the job done. Um, and then I think, frankly, probably the biggest reason is that a lot of people are embarrassed by their analytical code, um, and they don't want to share it because they're just embarrassed with all their for loops or whatever it is that they don't want people to see. But as I said before, there's really there's a bunch of common problems when you create analysis that we all know about. Um, and if you avoid these common problems, it frees up your cognitive space for more creativity. So if you're writing code that you know is going to be reproducible and you have tests in it to know that it's error free, you're going to have more time to actually think about that narrative part, which is in many ways the more important part from like a scientific perspective. Um, so as I said, we all know these problems, and I actually went through um, and made a list of a bunch of the problems. And the point of this slide is not for you to like look through every single one, um, but there are things like, oh, you rerun the analysis and you get different results. Like I think we all know that's an issue with reproducibility. Um, there's other ones like a second analyst can't understand your code, which could be thought of as an error in reproducibility. Um, you make a mistake, uh, that's an error with the accuracy of the code. So if you think that you're you know, calculating a linear model and you're actually not calculating linear model results, then you're going to have problems. 
And so as I said, remember before I was saying there was more than reproducibility, I think you can kind of group all the problems we run into into these three areas of reproducibility, accuracy, and collaborativeness. So as I said before, it's really important to define the process of analysis development because by defining it, like by not defining it, we're doing a disservice to people who have these errors that we've all come across and that we can all list and think about. And instead we're like leaving people with the ability or the, we're leaving people a lot of rope to hang themselves with. Like we're leaving people to think that they're personally bad at analysis or they're personally like making all of these human errors in their code and that's why they're making mistakes. So human error, as I said before, there is um, Etsy inspiration in this, and this is because Etsy had this really great culture of um, blameless postmortems that centered around the idea of like redefining human error and how we understand it. Um, and that the reason why Etsy did this is because Etsy's like this website with so much traffic, so the operations team that like kept the website going was one of the most important teams at the company. And so this whole like paradigm of human error really comes from that operations world. Um, and a lot of the work at Etsy is centered around this like paradigm shifting book, the field guide to understanding human error. Um, and so you could like read the whole book. I'll give you the summary, which is that essentially the paradigm shift that's presented in this book is the idea of switching from blaming a person to blaming the process for failing the person. So, you know, if there is like a place where this is implemented a lot is with in the aviation industry, like if there's a plane crash, they go through and like very, very diligently look at the the flight itself and figure out can they create new safeguards so that there won't like whatever the pilot did that caused this problem they can create safeguards so that that doesn't happen again um, and there's a lot of trust in this i think it's really important because there is the assumption that the person who like did the error the person who like committed this error they were acting in a way where they thought that this error wouldn't happen like i don't think anyone who during a job has a mistake, they didn't like set out to make that mistake, right? Like they set out thinking they were doing the right thing and then the process failed them so that they got a result that they weren't expecting. Does that make sense? I see like, okay, I see puzzled looks. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, like the, idea, the whole idea is like the current system failed the person with good intentions. Um, and as I said, Etsy had this culture. I think it was like a really famous um, culture. And I did want to just say, because I don't know how many people saw the news from Etsy yesterday, but John Allspaw, who was the CTO, and he, uh, he left yesterday from Etsy and kind of like a dramatic day for them. But he was like an amazing person, and I'm so grateful to have uh, worked with him, and he influenced my thinking so much. So I just want to like give a shout out to him uh, on this like difficult time for them. But anyway, it just created this really wonderful culture at Etsy, and I think anyone with an engineering background will be familiar with this type of practice where like if engineers made a mistake, they felt really safe talking about it, they felt really safe sharing their mistakes um, because they knew that they wouldn't be personally blamed, they knew that their jobs weren't in jeopardy by sharing it, and then by sharing it, everyone could work together to create safeguards against this problem from ever happening. And so yeah, like the blameless postmortem process is the idea of like in, at, at, in Etsy, it was like a very formal, we all get together in a room and talk through exactly what happened, create a timeline um, and figure out like what, what happened and what we can change about the system in order to keep it from happening again. So like visually, just to like really nail this home, you have an error that happens, you have a blameless postmortem where you discuss the system changes to prevent the error and then you adopt a new process at the end. And then just to like talk about the opposite of this culture, which again I think is the current culture in sort of the analysis world. Um, and uh, like an engineer who thinks they're gonna be reprimanded or blamed um, for an error is gonna, gonna be disincentivized to share the details necessary to get an understanding of the mechanism, pathology, and operations of the error. So if you have like a blameful culture, then you're gonna have people who are embarrassed to share their code, who are embarrassed to talk about their process, sounds like the current state of analysis development. So as I said before, like we all have run into these problems, right? 
And when I think about this conference, there's already been, like we were all going to sessions where we were presenting possible solutions to these problems. Um, so like one of the talks was about a data validation service where you would have like, a, like CI testing for your data validity. So that's like a really good example of an action item that would have come from running into a problem here. And so like we as a community have kind of gone through this blameless postmortem process where we've run into problems and then adopted new processes and we come to conferences and talk about those processes and think that they're the right solution. And so when I had this slide of problems, we could actually create basically a list of what we think um, the best solutions are for those, like as a community, in my opinion. Um, when I talk about opinions, I actually want to call these opinions. And so I have things like code review, um, creating modular tested code, using executable scripts, um, watchers for changed data. I think that was a lot of like what Mike Bostock was just talking about, um, kind of only changing data when it, you need to or only updating parts of a visualization rather than the whole thing. Um, but I think we could all, like, I would be hard pressed. I don't think anyone at this conference would disagree with most of what's happening here. Um, so if we talk about, so this is sort of the opinionated and opinionated analysis development. Um, and as I, I love this part of the talk because I have lots of years of experience of being opinionated. Um, and as an example of that, uh, I remember a few years ago I went to a party and <laughs> my friend was like, oh, I never fight with anyone else except for you. Um, and, and so I know how to be opinionated in the wrong ways and how to alienate people. And I'll give you a little bit of a, an idea of how to do this from personal experience. Um, so how to not win friends and influence people. Uh, the most important thing, like, you know, going in and saying, like, well, actually, you need to test your code, like, or you need to do these, you know, you need to uh, have someone do a code review, and why wouldn't you do that? Um, that's definitely a way to not convince people to do code review. Um, you can add in, like, the wonderful medium of Twitter so that you're purposefully miscommunicating and not able to express yourself. That seems like the point of the medium at this point. Um, and then my favorite, you can kind of be the Kool-Aid guy and like have specific tools that you think people should, should use. So you're like, well, actually, if you use R and R Studio and you use this package, then you wouldn't have any of these problems. And I'm only going to express that in 140 characters. Um, and so again, I actually think this is kind of the current culture of talking about and spreading tooling. Um, and I think it's pretty toxic. Um, and like I said before, one of the things, like, I feel like it's important to honor the fact that, like, as one of these people who had to learn the hard way how to stop doing this, um, I do think, like, it does come from, like, people who aren't self-conscious and they're enthusiastic in helping other people. This is the same quote as before. Like, if you feel safe and you feel safe to mis make mistakes and you'll be excited about sharing it. But we're kind of just not sharing it in the right way, in my opinion. Um, and so, I mean, with this opinionated software and defining the process, I think we can actually have a shift from saying, I know better than you, like I'm the Kool-Aid guy coming in, to saying something like, you know, lots of people run into this problem all the time, and here's software that takes best practices and makes a solution for you. Like, you shouldn't feel bad about making this mistake, it happens all the time. In fact, we've engineered a solution to help with this. And so opinionated software generally is this idea, like I think, I mean my understanding is the first opinionated software was like Ruby on Rails. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong with that. Um, but the idea with opinionated software is just that it's a belief that a certain way of writing code and a certain set of practices um, is inherently better because it helps you craft results around that process. Um, and this creator of Ruby on Rails had a quote saying, you know, it's a strong disagreement with the conventional wisdom that everything should be configurable. And in that framework, like, it should be impartial and objective. But in my opinion, that's the same as saying that everything is equally hard. And I think that's sort of where we're at right now with analytical code, where it's like you can do it however you want, but you're going to run into these problems, and we're not going to tell you the right solution to them. Um, and just to like identify um, <laughs> one of the most motivating things for me like that got me thinking about this was sitting in a meeting once where um, someone had created kind of this like non-opinionated software. You could even almost think of it as software that is implementing the wrong opinions. Um, and it was just, you know, it wasn't reproducible. It was had like these weird dependencies on like dynamically changing things without any sort of 
um, any sort of visibility into the connections from different data sets. Um, and I just remember sitting in that meeting and thinking like, like this is bullying, <laughs> like there are rules, like there are rules to how we do this and we shouldn't be embarrassed about talking about it and we shouldn't make it like someone's personal responsibility how to do it right. So you know, you can say like, this is analysis, <laughs> there are rules. Or if you're really on board with me, you can say, you know, this is analysis development um, or analysis engineering. Um, and there's rules how we do it. And it's not because you're personally failing. It's because that we run into these problems all the time and that we're in a blameless culture where we can talk about it. So just to kind of sum up, I think it's really important that we define the process of technically creating the analyses. I think it's really important that we define opinions based on common processes, um, common errors, and then shift the blame from individuals using these like blameless postmortem kind of culture as a community. Um, push for software that we think makes it easy to implement these opinions. So I think you know obviously R and Python and some other languages are good with that. Um, and then really focus on the creativity and that narrative developing aspect and instead of focusing on people doing it wrong. Um, so with that, you know, like, like I think we would all do be well served to try to stay away from sort of this culture of dictating what people should do. Um, and I think if we start to do this and define the process, we'll just be in a much better place as a community. So, so that's all I have. Um, but can definitely take questions or feel free to tweet opinions at me too. <laughs> definitely used to that. So, cool.